and there would not be many casualties and they would be returning as local heroes. And of course, the real situation was very different. The war was not over by Christmas 1914. The fighting was very bloody indeed. Casualties were enormous and conditions in the trenches, in fact, were probably worse than anything they experienced at home. By this time, John's best friend and cousin, Nicholas, who had been fighting in the trenches, had suffered a serious head injury and was being repatriated to Ireland. For him, the war was over. But for John, it was just beginning. He was posted to the front in southern Belgium. He was positioned in a reserve area uh, in near Ypres at Plogue 9, and John Condon's unit was called up to, to plug the gap, amongst others. And the, the Germans actually succeeded in overrunning the section which John Condon was placed, and uh, he, he, was, he was missing with hundreds more of his comrades. He died in the, the second battle of uh, Ypres. Uh, that was in 1915, spring of 1915, just a month after the first gas attack north of Ypres, chlorine gas. And he died on the, the 24th of uh, May 1915 at uh, a place, a farm there, called Mousetrap Farm. They had to, to, to attack a hill that day. Well, this is the exact spot where John Condon, the youngest soldier of the First World War, uh, that lad from uh, Waterford, the spot where he died. He was hit by a bullet or by a bayonet or he was gassed, I don't know, because it was a gas attack. It started early in the morning, um, Easter Monday it was. Uh, it was a bright day, not a day to die, of course. Well, of course, when they come and told me father that he was uh, missing first, you know, it, my father said, well, do you realize his age at the time when he was missing? Do you John Condon was just one of a quarter of a million Irishmen who found themselves here for almost four years. Winter was the worst, of course. Freezing temperatures, ankle-deep pools of water at the bottom of trenches, rats and the stench of death everywhere. It was, many said, a living hell. Every now and then, another offensive over the top would be ordered. It was a recurring horror. Comrades around you shot down, perhaps blown to oblivion by shells. Some would fall wounded onto the tangles of barbed wire, sometimes to wait for days to die while the rats ate at their feet, their comrades helpless and huddled in the trenches, surrounded by the screams of the dying. They had left Ireland as heroes, off to fight for the freedom of small nations. But when they came back home, the events of 1916 had changed everything. From then on, those returning found their uniforms, which before had been a symbol of honor, now an embarrassment or even a symbol to be reviled. The focus was now on achieving an independent Irish Republic. And even in Waterford, which was still very Redmondite in its politics, conditions were now very different. And um, they returned to an Ireland which had largely forgotten them. It was eight years before John Condon's body was found. His body was found. Uh, he was still wearing his uniform, his boots, braces, and there were numbers on, on these boots and braces, and by means of that, uh, they could identify the bodies, of course. When he was missing, it was about four years after they found out that he died. Well, they found a piece of boot on, on, the, on the body. But uh, John, with, with John Condon's army number on it, which is still on it now, 6322. John Condon's body was buried in Paul Capel Cemetery, just one of the dozens of World War I graveyards dotted all around this part of Belgium. No member of his family ever came to see his grave. The reasons were financial. But in February of this year, the Condon cousins, John and Sonny, were invited by force to visit the place where John Condon was laid to rest. They were the first members of the family to come here since the boy soldier was buried here over 80 years ago. 
but they're very, very emotional ones. You know, to see all these people coming soon, to see all the gravestones here like this. Well, you know, it's a known that Pat and John had been down there, all the other lads, you know, but they died for them. Out in, out in this big field down buried like that, it's very emotional. Isn't it? The Condons visited the town of Messim, where an Irish peace school is based. Outside the town is the Island of Ireland Peace Park, located here because in the battles of the Somme and Passchendaele, thousands of Irish troops were killed. In June 1917, what was left of the two decimated Irish divisions came together. In the trenches, Catholic and Protestant, Nationalist and Loyalist fought together, side by side. Hundreds of them died, but the battle was deemed a success. A magnificent round tower was built by the Journey of Reconciliation Trust to commemorate the Irish who fought here. The aim of the Trust is to teach Irish people from North and South about the Great War and to demonstrate how both sides of the Irish divide were able to fight on the same side successfully. During Sonny and John's visit, a Belgian minister unveiled plans for a hostel to accommodate Irish visitors who come here. It's an impressive project and it will be known simply as the John Condon Memorial Hostel. Condon is the symbol of the youth who has fought for us. Condon is the symbol for what we don't want in the future. We want to have young people here who can live here. For us, John Condon is a symbol of for all what the Irish people did for us in the past. And you'll find that whenever there's a parade here in the scenes, the houses all fly three flags. They fly the Belgian flag, they fly the Union Jack, and they fly the Trickler. So they offer no offence. They're very grateful to all of the, the, the British and the Irish who came and fought here and liberated them. What we're saying to our people is that it happened in 1917 that they fought side by side, nationalists, republicans, unionists, loyalists. That was an example to all of us. And what we're saying, this is the stage in all of that development to try and bring our people together, at least to solve their differences through dialogue instead of war. Uh, as you know, we've done the Peace Park, the International School for Peace Studies, and we've done the fellowship programs. And what we've argued all along is that it's no sense in just having those. We need some resource in which we can hold our people here when they do come and offer them the facility. Uh, so this here will be a 128-bed village that the Belgian and the Flemish government are going to build for us. So if the Belgians never forgot the Irish who contributed to their freedom, why were John Condon and so many others forgotten in Ireland? After the war, the returning soldiers were treated with suspicion. They, after all, were British soldiers in a changing Ireland, where independence was on the horizon and where the shackles of a British system were being kicked off. The great loss of perhaps more than 70,000 Irishmen in World War I was colossal. But the new powers that be, or perhaps the collective consciousness of the new republic, were to bury the memory of our World War I dead with their bodies in graves in Belgium and elsewhere. So in time, the memory of John Condon and of all the other brave Irishmen who gave their lives and our understanding of their reasoning and intent was to dim and be lost. It's only in recent years that the minds of the nation would re-examine and seek to understand the men embroiled in one of the greatest tragedies to befall this country. In Waterford, the issue was still potentially divisive. Here, to ensure unity or avoid unseemly controversy all these 88 years after the event, it was agreed that rather than erect a memorial to John Condon and the World War I dead, they would instead erect a monument to the Irish dead of all wars. Where are the faces laughing in the glow of morning years, the lost ones scattered wide? Give me your hand, O oh brother, and let us go, crying about the dark for those who died. You've been watching Nationwide, but tomorrow night at 7... On these fields, 